The following minute contains spoilers for the 2017 movie The Square. I don't know why this made me think of it for no reason. Have you ever heard of a it's I think it's called The Square or The Box. There's a movie, it's like The sim- Cube? <laughs> no. Not the cube. Artsy this guy movie. On by Jordan. <laughs> well, I just mean, like, I'm, I'm, I have no reference to the cube. Anyway, there's basically it's a fine art museum, and a guy drives by and he sucks up one of the the modern art pieces, not realizing that it's an intentional pile of dust. It doesn't. We'll cut it. It doesn't matter. Oh no, this is gonna become the whole episode. Explain <laughs> to me this movie. I don't even really remember why. And that's it. He's sad. He maybe kills somebody, but he can't. I don't remember if that ever gets proven. And at one point, one of their art pieces is they <laughs> they unleash a guy who acts like a monkey in the art benefactor dinner, and it's very unsettling. And that's the movie. You should watch it. It's pretty good. I want you to know that Bryce is literally covering his face, crying, laughing right now. <laughs> You're right, George. We are going to cut that. <laughs> yeah, you oh probably God. should. There's nothing to it. I don't know why I brought it up. <laughs> this episode of The Modern Rogue brought to you by Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com slash rogue. Spell it right. R-O-G-U-E. Give it a free trial. When you fall in love, get 10% off by using promo code rogue. Jordan Breeding, as one of our most senior writers at The Modern Rogue, there's nothing I love more than when you bring to me Things I've already forgotten that I've read about. What do you have this time? (laughs) All right, so what we're talking about this time is questions that either have yet to be answered or took way too long to answer. I don't know if that's too nebulous. This one's gonna get philosophical. You do realize that all I want to do is talk philosophy at all times. It's fortunate that YouTube allows all of us to sound very, 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 very smart. <laughs> yeah, well, good. So I guess my first question then is, you know, what do you think we should do when a, when there's a dead body? Number one, do CPR. <laughs> Number two, call 911. Number three, shrug and say, well, there was nothing we could have done. <laughs> that seems like a that seems like a decent catalog of all the things you should try. But in America, at least, there's really no set rule for what you do. <laughs> when you've got one. There's no like federal law that says, if a dead body here, then take and do this with it. So for example, in North Carolina a few years ago, a woman's 93 year old mom died and she just kept it in the house because quote, she wanted to see how it decomposed. You know, why not? I I think in most religious contexts, it becomes property at that point, at which point it's like, why not set up the GoPro, open up the TikTok channel, <laughs> right. uh, dead bodies <laughs> decomposing, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. go for it. That's her inheritance was to monetize <laughs> her mother's decomposing corpse. <laughs> but uh, so in North Carolina, there there's no law against that. Uh, the, she did still get in trouble and they did take the body away because she never actually reported the death. So that's illegal. It's quite literally, if she had put it on TikTok, it would have been fine. <laughs> Cause then the world would know. That would have, that was the big issue, I guess. She just selfishly kept it to herself. Um, everything is content. I, I, I can't decide if I'm happier or sadder for knowing this. Uh, <laughs> it, it, but what is your take? Like, what should the rules be? Well, I don't know. Like it changes a lot depending on where you are. So for example, a similar thing happened in Alabama. I mean, he reported the death. He buried his wife in the front yard, which is closer to what you were originally kind of talking about. And all of his neighbors got mad. And the city actually sued to have him dig the body up. But they realized there was no, you know, there's no rule against putting it there. Real quick, I just love how many of these discussions boil down to that Air Bud moment where somebody's looking at a book and says, there's no rule against burying your wife in the front yard. Only in this case, I assume it's a subdivision and they have a housing covenant and somewhere in there it says, you don't get to just bury your wife in the front yard. Well, I do think they sort of like, yeah, they finagled it that way. Like they did still manage to to force him to unbury her. And then he cremated her and buried her again. And everybody said that was fine. Even though it's essentially the same thing. <laughs> so, so so basically it's like, you're telling me you buried your wife right here? And he's like, yeah. And you didn't set her on fire first? <laughs> right. and he's like, no, why would I right. do that? And they're all like, 
that's messed up, bro. You need to dig that body up. You need to set it on fire and then bury it in the front yard. And he's like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, actually, just this is a tangent because everything's going to be a tangent today. So, you know, funerals are always going to be pushing cremation, uh, not cremation, uh, pushing... Oh my God, what is the word? Caskets? No. Death boxes. No. Come on down to Ted's <laughs> death boxes. They're the right size and they're made of pine wood. Uh, when you put chemicals in a body so it decomposes slower. Oh, em embalming. Embalming, holy crap. I don't know why that was so hard Which, for me Which by the think. way, there is like a, a, a reverse cremation where they put chemicals in that just dissolve your body and then you can like pour the goop of your nutrients around a tree. And it's like, now he lives in the tree now. <laughs> That's, Have you heard of this? I haven't. That's pretty gross. I, I, I yeah. wrote a script a while ago about some <laughs> of this stuff. Gross. The goop? You, <laughs> I don't know if I want to go as Bryce, goop. Is it gross? That's a person, Jordan. It can't, a person <laughs> can't call people gross. You hate humans becoming one with trees. You would prefer old fashioned, put them in a box, put them underground. I don't think, I don't know that I have a preference. I just, if, if my end result is goop, I think I'll be sad. But I suppose if I'm goop that's been sucked up into a tree, that's, that's nice. <laughs> That was the least convincing <laughs> endorsement I've ever heard. That yeah. was like when I saw somebody from the Houston Astros clearly reading a cue card that was like, I strongly endorse this service and or pro product. <laughs> Whatever. My only point was that embalming is something that's forced upon a lot of families from funeral homes who will say that it's legally mandated, but it basically isn't anywhere. And sometimes they'll even try and push embalming before cremation, which obviously makes no sense at all. I think I'm okay with that upsell. It's when they push embalming before they've actually died that I draw the line. <laughs> you mean Botox or are you just coming up with a hypothetical scenario? Uh, <laughs> you know what? I thought it was hypothetical. Turns out it's not. Yeah. But to your point about ashes and cremation and stuff like that, you know, there are several rules about like, hey, don't dump your dead uh, dad's ashes all over, for example, a stadium, a sports stadium, a public place. But they're, it's always ignored. And it's ignored to such an extent that when the Yankees wanted to build a new baseball stadium, a bunch of people got really pissed because like their grandpa was at the old one. And so the Yankees actually tried to appease these people by like bringing some dirt over and being like, I'm pretty sure your grandpa's in that, the dirt that we brought, so it's fine. Do you know what one of the m most egregious offenders of, of this rule is? Uh, like, like the like, place where they have this as the biggest problem? What would your guess be? I would think Disney adults uh, or Disney World. And where do you think would be the biggest problem? Oh, I don't know. Uh, in the Come castle? On. It's obvious. In the... Oh, the haunted house. <laughs> in the haunted mansion. Oh, the haunted it's mansion. It's a real yeah, yeah. problem. Everybody is... They all think they're clever, just dumping out, not realizing <laughs> that definitely there are cameras being yeah. like, my guy, you can't dispose of human remains on this roller coaster ride. It's a thing that everybody does. So that's something that's a little bit more... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's a little more technically there are laws about it, but people just ignore it. I love your take that you can't argue with success. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it works, yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, I mean, at that point, I assume you're just sort of, you're baking in the fine into the funeral cost equivalent or whatever. You're like, whatever I would have spent on a box, I will spend begging Disney's forgiveness. Well, and plus also like, you know what's gonna happen at 2 a.m. is somebody's gonna come in and sweep them in and throw them in a garbage bin. I, I think it was also maybe in Boston again, but um, a family wanted, and I think for religious reasons, like you had been saying, they uh, their grandmother died or something, they wanted to bring her home to prepare for a funeral, but the hospital refused. And so they had to like sue to make it happen or something like that because there was no law they just thought it was weird, I guess. On the other side, the whole reason Victorian homes had a parlor room was so that after a loved one died, they could kind of hang around for a little bit until they began to stink up the place and then they would, you know, throw them in the dirt. Uh, but, but, but 
it, it's not as weird as as one would think. Sure, right. It's still interesting to me that it's it's complex enough that again, there's just no nobody has ever sat down and said this is what we're doing for everywhere. It just kind of depends on where you are, and it's all kind of stitched together. So speaking of dead bodies and how you apparently lose what is it nine grams, eleven grams, or whatever when you die? What was the name of that movie? That was the dude who <laughs> like just like I have an idea. It's science. I'll take a dying person and I'm gonna put them on a scale. Right. And I'm gonna just gawk as they shed this mortal coil. And I'm gonna watch the needle and however many grams or ounces, I'm like, ha ha, that's a soul. Gotcha, God. And that's art. But his job would have been much more difficult if he tried to use a kilogram because up until 2018, so pounds are just, a mathematical, like, this is how much gravitational force is being pulled upon you or whatever. <laughs> oh, hey, sorry to interrupt. Um, Jordan was mistakenly describing the definition of weight and not mass. Pounds and kilograms are mass. And there are a bunch of different types of pounds, but ever since the 1800s, the United States and international definition of the pound has just been a really precise, portion of a kilogram. In fact, a lot of customary units rely on the nearest metric unit for their definitions since like the fi late 50s. Anyway, that's all I got. <laughs> but a kilogram was actually based on a, on a thing. Like they called it prototype kilogram and it was an actual object. And so if something weighed 10 kilograms, it weighed literally exactly 10 of these physical objects. But the problem, as you can imagine, is that it deteriorated over time. Am I right in remembering this is kind of a, a, a Napoleon thing? Like Napoleon said, shut up everyone. Whatever this stick is, that's a meter. Uh, however much this is, that's a kilogram. I don't remember if it's Napoleon, but I do, uh, there, there was all this precedent of like, during feudal times, uh, there was a lot of these like, your bounty to me is 10 bags of grain and then I will pay you 10 bags of grain, and yet the bags that you have to give to me are inexplicably twice as big as the bags that I give to you. Oh, sorry for the uh, interruption again. Um, so they got bits and pieces of this, right? Uh, there was a time in like the late 1700s when the, France was like, hey everybody, we're gonna do the metric system. Isn't that cool? And then they, they really try to get the word out in advance and get everybody on the same page. And then, and then people just kind of couldn't be bothered. Um, some metric, some merchants did use the metric system, but they were kind of rounding up in their favor on the sly. So Napoleon said, oh no, this is not working at all. We need to, he pushed out a different system entirely. That was kind of a compromise between the two. And this was designed specifically for merchants to use. And it only lasted a couple of decades and then it was reverted back. Okay, that's it for this one. Likewise, there are tricky units like what is a second of time? And eventually they had to define a second as the number of bouncy thingies at a molecular level of cesium 130 whatever. Once you hit 2000 of those, that's a second or something yeah. like that. Like like it, it becomes um, lengths uh, you could do, if I remember correctly, uh, the amount of time that this type of light, uh, the distance it goes in this unit of time, because you have to nest everything in, in metric in measurable permanent uh, measurements. Right, actually, you know what? Let's just take that as an opportunity for, for once to do a very natural segue, which is talking about what time is. Because I think you're sort of already bringing up an interesting point, which is there are so many prevailing theories as to what time even is, um, and kind of the two main ones. Uh, so this is a thing I, I took, I had to take a metaphysics class in college just to get my degree. And one of the things that they brought up was this problem where I wouldn't say it's half and half, but there are a lot of scientists that look at time as like a river where you're sort of constantly adding to it. Uh, so, you know, the past is real, the present is real, but the future is obviously not real and you're just kind of constantly adding versus a block universe, which is the thing that's more popular recently, which is like, all of the past and the present and the future is set and done and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And, you know, uh, 
uh, the iPhone 37 is just as real as the iPhone 3 is just as real as Abraham Lincoln. And the, the comparison they use is, you know, time is to space, you know, just because we're both obviously sitting in Austin, Texas, that doesn't mean that Charlottesville, Virginia is not real just because we're not perceiving it because we're both in Austin, Texas together. There's a wonderful book. It's a very, very small, short book, uh, the, the kind that you put in your bathroom to just flip through called Einstein's Dreams. And it just hmm. proposes all of these wild metaphors, like what if time is like a river? Or what if like time is like a lever? Or what if, what if, yeah. what if? I deeply enjoyed that book, but it became very weird to me when in recent years I began to hear about the many worlds theory of, mm. of time, which is basically at any given moment, because of science reasons that wait, we don't have wait, time wait, to go I, into I here, anything no, no, that no, 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 could no. happen that has a non-zero possibility of happening does happen. And just the universe is constantly expanding right. into an infinite uh, tree branches of all varieties. It's part of what allowed me to enjoy the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe when they said, we're going back in time, don't worry about it. <laughs> because right. there's no consistency, it's all many worlds. Right, right. Uh, yeah, That was, so that was part of the same class. They called that modality or whatever. It's like, the, uh, a lot of philosophers are like, well, something has to happen to the choices you don't make. I think, you know, it could have happened. It probably did happen. And so some people will take that to very literally mean, yeah, time has split off. I think Everything Everywhere All at Once has one of the most fun versions of that for me. It's sort of like, uh, did you ever see The One with Jet Li? Oh yeah, yeah, where, where he was just a badass. Well, he's just like, he's killing all of his other selves, but then it equally distributes. So there's one Jet Li in one universe who's just like super jacked and doesn't know why, because he doesn't know about the multiverse or whatever. And he's just like, I don't know, I woke up today and I could throw a house. It's very odd. I really enjoyed that movie as a kid. <laughs> Part of me wants to fret about which one is right, but also it's not like I get to vote. <laughs> and choose one or the other. Yeah. It's like, it's whatever it is. Yeah. Hey, uh, sorry for the interruption uh, yet once more. I know Brian's had that we don't have time for this, but the guys said some things that I feel like need more context so you're less misinformed. Uh, two things right off the bat. Many worlds is not a theory, it is an interpretation. We'll get to why that's important in just a bit. Two, it's not really about time, it's more about quantum mechanics. Um, so disclaimer up front, I don't really know quantum mechanics very well. Neither does Brian, neither does Jordan. So let's talk about quantum mechanics. My understanding is that if you look at something that's very small, like an atom or a subatomic particle, the closer you look, the less certain you are about where it is. Instead, what we find is what's called a probability density. And we can kind of map out, oh, uh, the particle is more likely to be here, less likely to be here, not likely at all to be here, right? That's basically what it boils down to. There's this thing called a wave function, and it's a description of the quantum nature of one of these atoms or particles. And basically what it is, is it's these probability densities, but for a bunch of different properties, because we have uncertainty about a bunch of these properties, the closer we look. So. This is so counterintuitive to our uh, natural understanding of the world, which is called classical physics, right? Cause and effect, that whole thing. It's so counterintuitive because it's just math, right? Quantum mechanics is just math that happens to work out. It's so counterintuitive that we've developed a bunch of different interpretations of the math. There's stories that we tell to help us explain why it might work. But there's a problem with interpretations, which is that Interpretations inherently are untestable. You can't it, conduct an experiment that rules something out. So it's a, j just a different mode of thinking about quantum mechanics that is sometimes helpful and sometimes not helpful. But there are problems with all interpretations. So one of those interpretations is called the Copenhagen interpretation. It's actually like a few different interpretations kind of under that umbrella term. It basically says, hey, when this uh, subatomic particle interacts with another, the wave function collapses because the, the particle could only be in one spot in order for that interaction to happen, so it collapses. And we can see exactly where that particle is. Many worlds interpretation is very similar but the wave function never collapses. 
Instead, things continue to be in a superposition of different probable outcomes, right? And that just keeps growing and evolving over time. So it's not really, uh, you know, Brian mentioned branching universes, which gives a very clear idea in the mind, a very sci-fi idea. But it, it, it's, I think it's a little bit more helpful to think of it not as many worlds or branching timelines or branching universes, but as one world existing in a superposition of different probabilities, just like the subatomic particles are before the wave function collapse, right? It just, that is just how things are on the really small scale. That might be how things are on the big scale. That's what many worlds interpretation is kind of trying to describe. Um, anyway, if you, if you really wanna know more about this, I think you should check out um, PBS Space Time. I highly recommend it. They have many videos on uh, the many worlds interpretation. They have videos on quantum mechanics and just a lot of other really cool stuff. Matt Adada and his crew are a lot more qualified to talk about it than us, and uh, they do a great job of explaining it. Anyway, okay, that's it. Uh, get back to it. It's not exactly the same thing, but obviously there are countries like China that have decided that the entirety of the country, no matter how big it is, is all on Beijing time. So you've got cities that are 3,000 miles apart having to deal with, you know, how it doesn't, get dark until after midnight and stuff like that. So it's just interesting how everybody's like relationship to time is is changing depending on where you are and I guess whatever the philosophical 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 attitude is. No, I like philosophical. We're going <laughs> to stick with that one. Uh in that philosophical vein, do you think it matters like uh there is a brief moment that the of all companies the Swatch Corporation wanted to establish one kind of metric style unit of time called beats and it would be worldwide no time zones just you locally figure out i don't know at what beat do you want to open up your shop and at what beat do you want to close it like would would that be better or does that just make us all borg so every beat was like per second almost so i think it was like 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 two and a half seconds or something yeah it was like a, a thousand beats a day or some some yeah, nice yeah. round metric sounding number so if i drive 10 miles now i'm 300 beats different or whatever? Is, is that how you're saying it would work? As I understood it, the idea was, let's say you hop in the car and in your community, you wake up at 800 beats and everyone tends to go to bed at 1100 beats or yeah. whatever. Uh, then you drive, I don't know, 500 miles west and now you find yourself in a different community where the local norms are, well, we tend to wake up at uh, 1100 beats and go to bed at, at uh, 2300 beats or whatever. Yeah. Even as I'm saying it, it sounds dumb as hell <laughs> and a marketing stunt. Well, well done, Swatch, that I, I'm still I, thinking about this 30 years later. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, you know, obviously, I think uh, a thing that we're always arguing about is uh, what to do with daylight savings. Uh, and obviously there's, what is it, Arizona that has said, we're not doing it, we refuse to do it. It's the same all the time. Where, where are you at on this? Because I have, I have a hot take. This is coming off the top of the dome. I didn't look this up. A lot of people think that it had to do originally with like farming or something like that, but that's not actually the case. And it's a little bit more to do with actually suppressing your ability to buy stuff during World War I thereabouts because they were trying to get people to buy less things and to hoard more stuff or, or whatever. I don't know if that's anti-capitalist, but it's sort of intentionally trying to thwart consumer desires a little bit. So I don't see any point in it at all. If anything, it sounds harmful. There is a dollar amount that can be attributed to the shift in okay. changing time for everything. There's a certain number of accidents that happen. There's a certain amount of lost uh, productivity and so on. There's yeah. a certain number of missed meetings every single year. On the flip side, culturally, whenever we've tried to stop doing daylight savings, oh, humans don't like it. They get really upset. I do also know that in the early 2000s, I believe it was George W. Bush that signed into legislation moving the end of daylight savings time to after Halloween specifically because they were lobbied by the Eminem Mars Candy Corporation because they would prefer that there be more daylight hours at Halloween right. for kids to run around and 
collect and grab candy. <laughs> I've gone back and forth, but I think I, I dig, I dig changing things up and I'm okay with it. Uh, especially now that I don't have to actually reset clocks. Now that my phone just says, by the way, time is different now. And I'm like, cool phone. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I don't have a super strong opinion on it, but I, I, it would be nice to not have to retrain my young children twice a year, but it could change. I don't know. As always, Jordan, this is only the tip of the iceberg. You have written so much stuff over at themodernrogue.com, but you, of course, have your own channel, which is... Dr. Jordan Breeding, which most of the time is fine, except I was recently interviewed by an actual doctor, and he was like, oh, what's your specialization? I'm like, uh, stupid internet stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel dumb. I don't know why I chose this. <laughs> we mostly do really long videos. I told you recently, we just watched all 13 Halloween movies and I'm, I'm sitting in various places. At certain times I'm drinking Natty Light and I'm torturing myself until I explain them all. And um, watch it. On Elisa. There we go. I'm gonna quiz you. Squarespace, what do they do? Do they make squares or spaces? They make spaces with squares or rectangles. It's a bit of a hedge. They make websites. I'm gonna give you half credit on that one. Do they have award-winning, beautiful, gorgeous designs that anybody can use? Yes. Okay, good job, all right. Do they use things like video blocks to make the pages load faster? Sure. Oh, sure, okay, all right. Are they a nine-tentacle demon? What they do in their spare time is none of our business. Yeah, well, actually, that's legit. <laughs> that's very kind of you. Forget about Squarespace. Totally different question. What is the fastest way to take your idea and go from the street corner to the globe? Something that can scale automatically, that would use uh, distributed hosting, incredible design, that would get your message out to the world. Squarespace? Yeah, that was a trick question. It's Squarespace. Look, you guys know how much we love Squarespace. It's fast, easy, reliable. If you have a song in your heart, get it out to the world and use our friends over at Squarespace to do it. Here's the thought. Don't even give it a free trial. Go straight to buying it. Get 10% off. Keep us in business. Just make sure to use promo code ROGUE. R-O-G-U. Modern Rogue is supported in part by viewers like you at patreon.com slash modern rogue. In the description, you can find all of our credits and additional ways to support the show. You and me, do we want the job? The job? Yeah. Of... Hello, America. So you got a dead person oh. <laughs> just laying there. <laughs> You're wondering what to do. I want you to call one 888 Whoopsie doodle. Jordan or me will be there to help you through this crisis. We don't necessarily know legally whether or not anything. You know, I'm gonna stop. I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> okay, that's fair.